Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Foster from Northumbria University in England. Together with Robbie Dushinsky, I'm working on a Wellcome Trust funded project looking at the practice implications of attachment theory. This is one of a series of videos in which we look at um, the relevance of attachment concepts and research findings for practice and ask key figures in the field to talk to that. The focus of this video is parental intellectual disability and attachment. To talk about this, I'm delighted to introduce Professor per Per Granquist. Per is a psychology professor at Stockholm University in Sweden. He conducts research on a host of topics related to attachment theory. And one of Per's strands of research has been on attachment in the children of mothers with an intellectual disability. So it's great to have Per with us today. So Per, why might practitioners have traditionally assumed that parental intellectual disability is related to attachment issues in their children? Oh, I think there are multiple reasons for that actually. If you just look at the, the history of how these people have been viewed, they were subjected to sterilization practices up until the mid 70s in some countries. So there's a long tradition of assuming that these uh, people will not be able to function adequately as, as parents. And of course that's not without reason. There are lots of findings indicating that the children of these parents are a risk group in terms of development. So they have developmental delays and they have developmental problems, behavioral problems to a much higher extent than children who grow up in middle class, normal population families. And so therefore it's easy to make the inference that it is the parenting provided by parents with intellectual disabilities that is responsible for the difficulties in their children. They are a risk group after all. Um, so I think that it, it's in part a question of tradition and in part a question of looking at uh, deviations in development of these particular children. Now. You asked about attachment issues. Um, I would just like to make a remark on, on that term because it is a term that is often being used by practitioners I have seen when they are referring to difficulties with attachment in one way or the other uh, in these children. But attachment issues itself is a very vague and unclear term. So I'm often asking practitioners to be more incisive and clear on what they actually mean because it turns out oftentimes that they don't quite know what they mean. So sometimes they seem to be referring to attachment insecurity and attachment insecurity is a very common thing in the general population. Like we would expect 40% of children from the general population to have an insecure attachment. Um, so that's not a specific problem uh, that, that for these kids of course. Um, and secondly, sometimes they seem to be referring to an attachment disorder or absent attachment altogether. And that's very rare. And I haven't seen any persuasive evidence that children to parents with intellectual disabilities do not develop attachments. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want people to be clear on the difficulties that they are referring to here. So what actually does your research suggest is the link between parental intellectual disability and attachment insecurity in their children? It is an interesting story uh, actually because we find that insecurity is very slightly overrepresented in this group of, of children compared to a socioeconomically matched group of children whose mothers do not have intellectual disabilities or mothers with normal intelligence. Um, but there's a difference between these two groups of parents to begin with and that is that mothers with intellectual disability have very often been subjected to trauma and maltreatment during their own upbringing and if that has happened uh, to a very large extent in their upbringing then their children tend to be insecure and also to have disorganized or fearful attachment representations. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a, it's a question of the combination of intellectual disability and a history of severe maltreatment. So it isn't intellectual disability itself. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the mechanism that linked parental trauma to child disorganized attachment? Mechanisms is something that we 
always have difficulties with, I would say, in social sciences in general, and the field of attachment uh, is, is included there, of course. Well, we have looked, uh, in terms of uh, linking mechanisms, we have looked at parenting, and so what we have seen is that mothers who have been, intellectually disabled mothers who have been severely maltreated and, and suffered serious forms of trauma, they are less sensitive in relation to their children's needs, and lower sensitivity to their children's needs is in turn predictive of disorganization in their children. So it seems as expected that aspects of caregiving may mediate, at least in part, uh, these relations. How solid is disorganized attachment as an outcome measure for this kind of inquiry? That's a very good question, I think. It is, it's a complicated question in many ways, actually. Um, I would say that in our study it functioned very well as an outcome measure because we have these strong intergenerational links between parental trauma and child disorganization. Um, so in other words, it's a good outcome measure. But on the other hand, we also know from a series of other studies that disorganization may have other causes than simply intergenerational transmission of, of trauma or maltreatment. Uh, so it is not a specific outcome measure. Uh, it's a risky outcome measure in that regard because uh, there could be, there are other pathways leading to disorganization. But it, it, it worked quite well in this study, I would have to say. Can interventions with parents with intellectual disability improve their parenting capacity? Yes, um, there are some conflicting findings in, in the research literature here, um, but in general the question, uh, the answer is no doubt yes. So if they are being provided with parental support, uh, like very concrete things like showing them how to interpret the baby's signals, uh, or how to change diapers, uh, how to take care of bedtime routines, various things that have to do with parenting. There are a few studies showing in randomized controlled trials even that parenting can be greatly facilitated and also that child development can be put in a more uh, favorable direction as a consequence of, of the parental training. And this is something that I would like practitioners to be aware of because they often assume explicitly or at least implicitly that there isn't any real point in giving interventions to these parents because they are assuming that as a natural function of, of their learning disability they won't be able to profit from the intervention uh, and that's you know that that's uh, an inference that you can also understand comes almost deductively from the assumption that uh, these parents can't manage parenting to begin with, but they can and they need help and especially if they've been traumatized and maltreated of course. So placing this all in the context of the broader research, what does your research tell us about the implications of parental trauma? The carry home message really when we look at the transmission of insecurity, so trauma in the parent and insecurity and disorganization in the child is that that link is much stronger for parents who are vulnerable for one reason or the other. In our case it happens to be par parents with intellectual disability, but it could be something else conceivably like poverty or uh, socioeconomic stressors. Whereas when we look at the comparison group, that is a less vulnerable group and the association between parental trauma and child insecurity is not at all as strong. So it I guess this complicates a direct transmission model from trauma in the parent to insecurity in the child. It really has to do with the resources that exist within and, and around uh, a particular family. Mm -hmm.